Thanks. So I want to talk to you about multiple choice tests. So I'm talking about tests containing questions like this. Put your hand up if you've ever taken a multiple choice test. OK, I think that's everybody. Now put your hand up if you think that the, the scores from such tests are an accurate reflection of your knowledge or understanding of a subject. Right, very few hands. I've been in, uh, teaching in higher education for over half of my life. And I've been using multiple choice tests throughout that time. And many of my colleagues use multiple choice tests as well. And they're used by teachers uh, throughout the world at all levels of education. And they're used for professional examinations as well. Um, but I know that many people are skeptical about multiple choice tests. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. So one reason, I think the main reason, is that um, the scores are dependent to a certain extent on guesswork, on luck. Um, and that's really the focus of my talk. So wouldn't it be great if we could have multiple choice tests without the guesswork? There's another reason I think uh, people are skeptical about multiple choice tests is because they, they seem to think um, they can only test quite superficial knowledge. But that's not true. So if you look at that chessboard, um, imagine a question that said, with white to move first, what should white do to guarantee checkmate in three moves? And you could imagine four moves described, A, B, C, D. So I hope you can see that a question like that is really testing quite deep thinking or deep understanding, deep knowledge. Um, but it's not easy to create multiple choice um, questions. It takes a lot of time um, to create good questions. And we should be getting students to think harder about those questions and to give us more information. We shouldn't just ask students to select one option from four. So one thing we could do, for example, is to ask um, students to put them in order. What's your first choice? What's your second choice? Third choice? Fourth choice? And then we award a mark accordingly. So in 1997, I was asked to teach um, a class at quite short notice, a class of 70 students. And they were engineering product design students. And I had to teach them a, a course in systems and software engineering. And the, the assessment was completely up to me. So 70 students is a lot of students. And I decided to get them to write a short report each and also critique each other's reports. And also, I wanted to give them a series of multiple choice tests. So that by doing that, I wanted to assess how well they understood the content of my lectures and the content of the documents I was asking them to read. So multiple choice tests are very good for that kind of thing. So with a multiple choice test, you can cover a wide subject area in quite a short test. And I thought long and hard about the test that I would give to these students. Now, a good test has a profile of something like this. So the score should be a reflection of the knowledge, should be proportional to the knowledge or understanding that a student has. A student that knows everything should score 100%. A student that knows nothing should score zero. But for multiple choice tests, the profile is more like that. So imagine that spider question that I showed you at the beginning. So most spiders have four legs, um, four wings, big pardon, six legs, eight eyes, ten ears. The right answer is actually eight eyes. Now, if a student doesn't know what a spider is, and if there's no negative marking, and I'll talk about negative marking in a minute, then all the student can do is make um, a random guess, and they've got a one in four chance of getting it right. If a, a student knows that spiders don't have wings, but they don't know how many legs they've got, or eyes they've got, or ears they've got, then the student has got a one in three chance of getting it right. So I hope you can see that profile there. Um, and I knew about negative marking. So negative marking is designed to stop pure guesswork. So with negative marking, you award three marks for the right answer and minus one for a wrong answer. So if a, if a student is blindly guessing, they've got a one in four chance of getting three marks and a three in four chance of getting minus one. So if they're guessing over many questions, the minus marks cancel out the plus marks. Um, and the profile looks like this. Now, that, as you can imagine, students don't like negative marking very much. Um, and you can imagine that a student, for example, who knows the answers to some of the questions, 
but then guesses some answers to other questions, even if they're making educated guesses, which means they have some knowledge about a spider in this case, but they're still forced to make a guess between the answers they didn't know. So they've got some educate, they can make educated guesses, they've got some knowledge. Um, so a student who can get the right answer to some questions, but is making unlucky guesses on other questions, is getting minus marks, and those minus marks are somehow detracting from the mark the student really deserved due to their knowledge. So then it occurred to me that we don't need to force students to make a guess. We could get students to select any subset of the answers. So if a student, for example, knows that a spider doesn't have any wings but doesn't know which of these answers is correct, the student should be able to select all three and then we'll give them plus three, minus one, minus one. We're giving them one mark for having successfully identified one distractor. Or if a student can identify two distractors, a distractor means a wrong answer, then they should tick the other two and they get plus three minus one. They're getting two marks for their partial knowledge. So we've taken away the guesswork. And in fact, the score that a student gets is now zero, one, two, or three, depending on how many wrong answers they can identify. So this is a more subtle kind of test. Um, and the profile looks like this. So that looks like the profile of a good test. So I was really happy about that, um, and I gave that test to those students, and I've used it for many years subsequently. And I explained it to a lot of my um, colleagues, and I spoke to a couple of professors of education who hadn't come across it before. And I started reading some of the literature on multiple choice tests, and there's really a lot of literature. And I didn't find this described anywhere. So I wrote it up in a paper, um, and that was published in 2001, and I was very happy, and I thought that was the end of the story. Um, then, some years later, after more reading, more research on my part, I discovered that actually this has been reported before by more than one author. And the first paper I found that reports this is 1953. And also, some papers um, propose other kinds of multiple choice tests, which all ask students to do more than just selecting one answer from four. So the questions are the same, it's just, a qu it's just a case of what are you asking students to do. And I wondered why these um, test formats aren't more widely known, because they seem to make sense to me. So how come people don't know about these? How come people aren't using these? Um, well, I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. So because people don't know about them, people don't use them, we don't have the computer systems to support them. I'll say a bit more about that um, later. One particular thing with subset selection I found is that there's still some negative marking. So it's still based on a plus three minus one. So um, although my colleagues generally liked it, there was a bit of unease about switching from traditional tests to subset selection. And some of my students were also felt a little bit uneasy about it because actually the impact of the negative marking is a bit more severe than um, I indicated. So sometimes a student might tick the wrong answers. So, so they pick two answers out of the four, but they're both wrong, so they're getting minus two for that question. Or in the worst case, they might tick all three wrong answers, and they're getting minus three. So you can imagine that students didn't like that very much. But actually, you can have subset selection without negative marking. So how does that work? Um, here's the spider. Most spiders have four wings, six legs, eight eyes, ten ears. Now, if a student um, can identify, uh, knows that spiders don't have wings and they have more than six legs, but they don't know how many eyes they've got or how many ears they've got, they should tick both. And in that case, we'll give them half a mark. So that's instead of forcing them to guess, in which case they've got a 50-50 chance of getting one mark. If a student knows that spiders don't have wings only, but they don't know which of the other three is right, they should tick them all three, and we'll give them a third of a mark. And if a student doesn't know what a spider is, they shouldn't attempt the question, and we'll give them a quarter of a mark. Um, if a student attempts the question, but they select one or more of the wrong answers, then they get zero. So the profile of that is like the profile of a traditional multiple choice test. So, but we've taken away the guesswork now. We're not forcing students to guess. Um, so I think this should be much more acceptable to students 
Um, no reason to complain anymore, no negative marking. I think it should be much more acceptable to staff because the profile of marks for the class is the same. Um, the thing about negative marking is that um, s students don't like it because they, it's demoralizing, sometimes it's disheartening. Staff can see that students are disheartened and, and also it brings down the whole class average. So it's not easy for a student, for, for, a, for a teacher who's been using multiple choice tests for, for many years to suddenly switch to using a different format which gives rise to a different kind of profile of marks. Okay, but with this, I think it leads to the same kind of profile. So we're currently testing this, we're currently trialling it in my department, so that's the Department of Informatics at London South Bank University, we're trialling it with students. Okay, my last slide. So I've talked about traditional tests with negative marking, without negative marking. I've talked about subset selection with negative marking, without negative marking. I mentioned order of preference, so think about the chess question and the four different chess moves and asking the student to say, what's your first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice? Well, if that's delivered by a computer, it becomes answer until correct. So the computer can say, which answer do you think is right? And the student can have a go. And then the computer will either say, yep, that's right, let's move on to the next question. Or the computer will say, no, sorry, have another go. So that's answer until correct. And that's great for tests as a learning aid, as a learning tool. And students are finding out, as they go through the test, they're finding out what the right answers are. And they're also finding out how well they're doing. Okay, so it might not be what you want for a summative test. In other words, a formal assessment. Maybe you don't want that to happen. There's another thing on this um, slide, partial ordering. So partial ordering is kind of a combination of subset selection and, or and order of preference. It's a mathematical term. And basically, it means that students can answer in any way they like. Because subset selection is slightly restrictive um, in the sense that if a student has a clear first choice followed by a second choice, they can't express that with subset selection. They can only express joint first choice. With an order of preference test, students can't say that they genuinely have a first choice. In a, uh, they can't express, um, pardon me, they can't express equal belief in two answers that they've got a joint first choice. They're forced, in effect, with order of preference, we're forcing them to make an educated guess by opting for one of those answers as their first choice and the other answer as their second choice. So with partial ordering, we can allow any kind of um, response from students, and there's a sensible marking scheme for this. So I was very inspired by these ideas, and um, I saw that there weren't really computer systems to support these different test formats. So about three and a half years ago, I started working with a fabulous ex-student called Lucia, who's sitting over here, and an equally talented ex-colleague of hers called Martin. I'm also called Martin. And together, we developed a computer system that implements these different kinds of test format. So the idea is that you create a test as a PowerPoint document, one slide per question. You upload the test to our platform. You identify the right answer to each question, and then select the test format, so it might be um, answer until correct, or it might be subset selection, or it might be traditional. So I'd just like to conclude by saying that I'm absolutely convinced that um, there are better ways of doing multiple choice testing. We shouldn't just be using the traditional, crude, choose one from four multiple choice tests. Um, and I do believe that our students will appreciate it if the tests we set give rise to scores that are a more reliable reflection of their knowledge and understanding. Thank you for listening.